afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Nazareth Catholic College. Uh, my name is Paul Hoadley, and I'm the chairman at Debating SA. 2020 has been an interesting year for everyone for a number of reasons, but I'm very glad that we managed to uh, put on a face-to-face -face competition for the students, uh, it, it, albeit a reduced uh, number of, minor, of, of rounds in the minor round. Uh, the debate this afternoon represents the culmination of that competition for these students. So at this point, I'll hand over to Madam Chairman and we'll get things underway. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2020 Year 10 Division Debating Essay Grand Finals. My name is Melody and I am the chairman for this debate. The timekeeper is Matilda. The topic for this debate is that the law should treat social media companies as publishers. The affirmative team, seated to my right, is from Klenunga International High School, consisting of first speaker, Shrahitha, second speaker, Param Preet, and third speaker, Isaac. The negative team, seated to my left, is from Glenunga International High School, consisting of first speaker, Sapri, second speaker, Melissa, and third speaker, Isha. This grand final debate will be judged by a panel of five adjudicators, who are Paul Hoadley, Sonia Lo Logan, James Baker, Jenny Burrows, and Lachlan Hemsley. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound at five minutes, and a double bell will sound at six minutes. If required, a continuous bell will sound 30 seconds after the second bell, indicating that the speaker must conclude their speech. I ask that all mobile phones and other electronic devices will be switched off for the duration of the debate. I declare this debate open and call upon Trahitha to open the affirmative case. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's debate is that the law should treat social media companies as publishers. We define this topic as the law being the regulations associated with the legal system which stand worldwide. We define social media as a subset of the media industry with the exception that the content is user generated. We define publishers as companies with rights and the occurring responsibility of publishing news, intellectual and artistic content. Therefore, we interpret this topic as social media companies having to follow the laws currently in place for publishers, with publishers taking full accountability and not having to copyright their content. As a model, we propose that all social media companies be accountable for any content on their platform, and that social media companies give users guidelines about how to appropriately behave on the platform. We, the affirmative team, strongly agree with this topic. As the first speaker, I will highlight the critical role of social media in the spread of misinformation and emphasize the inequality between the treatment of social media versus publishers. My second speaker will display the incoherence of social media laws and how hate speech would be dramatically reduced if companies were treated as publishers. Our third speaker will skillfully rebut the opposing case, leaving you in no doubt that the law must treat social media companies as publishers. To my first point, social media companies have been taking advantage of their legal freedom to sway political standings and undermine the integrity of our democracy. Social media has become the gateway for the general public to access news and information. So when social media companies are knowingly hosting the spread of misinformation, these effects are not to be underestimated. One example is social media's role in the Brexit referendum. Britain's region of South Wales had one of the highest percentage of leave votes for the entire referendum, totaling at 66% according to The Guardian. Now, you may think that this seems completely reasonable, but the problem here is that when journalist and British author Carol Cadwallad surveyed the population, she discovered that the overwhelming majority had only voted like this because they had seen ads on Facebook that warned of Turkey joining the EU and refugees flooding into Wales. Just to clarify, there have never been
been any talk or consideration of this. These ads were completely fake. Yet it is clear that misinformation has so drastically altered people's opinions. This referendum alone was decided by 10% of the Welsh population and it is one of the hundreds of elections that are held each year. The influence of social media polls is evident. Even if we were to disregard the legal aspects, stealing the right of an individual to correctly form their beliefs is beyond morally incorrect. Social media companies have been able to escape liability of false advertising such as this, and as of now, they are exempt from any laws against it. Just as we don't rob banks because of the consequences, establishing repercussions will stop this spread of misinformation that so many social media companies are currently responsible for. And treating social media companies as publishers, ladies and gentlemen, would achieve just that. This leads me to my second point. There is a huge injustice that comes from the current lack of clarity between the rights of a platform and the rights of a publisher. A platform is a space provided by a company to enable free distribution of information. A publisher, on the other hand, is someone who curates and distributes content, but most importantly, has full legal responsibility for the material that is posted. Therefore, because social media companies are a platform, they have no right to curate any of the information on their site. However, social media companies are not complying with this defining factor. They are evading the law and exploiting the system by acting like a publisher and yet getting the exemptions of a platform. For instance, Facebook is registered as a social media platform and therefore it is supposed to be unbiased and neutral. Yet CEO Mark Zuckerberg has publicly announced to Congress that Facebook is quote unquote responsible for their content and that is why they have shut down and silenced certain political groups. This is clearly a double standard. Furthermore, the National Public Radio estimates that during the 2016 presidential election, 147 million Facebook users were subject to purposeful and intentional political manipulation. This, combined with Facebook's unequal censoring of individuals, shows that Facebook isn't just crossing the line with its classification as a platform, it is also crossing the line for freedom of political expression. The lack of regulation surrounding these companies means that by labeling themselves as a platform, Facebook can't escape the consequences. However, if social media companies were to be treated as publishers, they would be held responsible and legal action would be taken against them. Social media companies are not justified in jumping ship from platform to publisher. It is unfair and most certainly unjust. To conclude, it is clear that until the law steps forward to stop these drastic effects of social media as it currently stands, the companies and their leaders will continue to delay, deny, and deflect. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the law should unequivocally treat social media companies as publishers. Supreme to open the negative case. Good afternoon, 
Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the topic for today's debate is that the law should treat social media companies as publishers. We, the negative team, <coughs> strongly disagree with this statement. We agree with the definition presented by the affirmative team. Before I present my points, I, I would like to point out some flaws in the opposition's argument. The first speaker of the affirmative team has tried to tell you that Mark Zuckerberg admitted to being liable for content on <coughs> Facebook. However, just because Facebook has admitted that they were a publisher, this does not mean that the law should treat them as, as such. Mark Zuckerberg himself stated that Facebook was just a social utility, a neutral platform for people to communicate what they wished. This directly co conflicts with what the affirmative team has stated, and so Mark Zuckerberg can clearly not be considered a reliable or credible source. Today, I will be speaking about why social media companies cannot be considered publishers, and privacy issues associated with treating such companies the same way as publishers. Our second speaker will talk about how such companies will be liable for their users' posts, and finally, our third speaker will skillfully rebut and sum up our team case. Now to my first point. Publishers and social media companies are extremely different entities, and thus the law cannot possibly treat them the same way. The biggest difference between them is that the main use of social media amongst its users is to communicate with others. However, people go to publishers to publish their work or read or review articles. These platforms have functional yet very different uses. So how can the law treat them the same way? If this were to happen, the primary purpose of social media would be changed. The social media platform Facebook clearly establishes what its purpose is, saying, and I quote, Facebook's mission is to build community and bring the world closer together, end quote. This mission statement clearly indicates that Facebook is used to create connections between people, rather than to publish articles or other pieces, which is the work of a publisher. As well as this, publishers have the opportunity to review content that is to be published, to ensure that it meets the, com the publisher's values and standards, whereas social media companies cannot do this, unless it is a direct breach of their terms and conditions. An example of this is the renowned newspaper company, The New York Times, who is able to make editorial decisions about which news they wish to publish. They can review and fact check articles or pieces to ensure that they align with the Times' values. However, on social media, users can post any content anytime without needing to ask for consent or review. Social media company, companies simply do not have a viable way to read through, edit, and decline certain posts, like publishers. Billions of people share content online, and it is an unrealistic expectation for social media companies to regulate the 55,000 items that are posted every sec second. This would be an unnecessary expenditure and inefficient allocation of time, energy, and money for the company, as well as being an inconvenience for users, show overall showing why social media companies should not be treated as publishers. Now to my second point. If social media companies are regarded as publishers by the law, as a publisher, the company will have the right to distribute a work, post, image, or even personal information as they wish, perhaps distributing or selling such things to earn money. This is an issue of privacy, one that has been brought to light various times. One example of the significance of this issue is the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, where the personal data of millions of Facebook users was leaked and harvested without consent by Cambridge Analytica, a British political consulting firm. This privacy breach occurred only very recently, in 2018, proving that privacy breaches are real issues that must be addressed and reduced. So if a user's privacy is already being violated, how will allowing social media companies to reserve the right to distribute posts, images, and personal information help ease the situation or solve the issue? On the contrary, privacy breaches will become much more common. The social media company will be able to distribute images and original works posted on its platform, and these could be used in advertising, or perhaps even sold to another organization for profit. Ladies and gentlemen, let this sink in. If social media companies are treated as publishers by the law, they will own the right to distribute and even sell personal information. This breach of privacy is dangerous, unacceptable and cannot be tolerated. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the law should not treat social media companies as publishers.
because the two platforms have huge differences that hinder the law from being able to apply the same regulations to them. Further, users' privacy will be at risk, as social media companies will have the right to distribute and sell images, works, and even personal information. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not shoot the messenger. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's debate is that the law should treat social media companies as publishers. As my first speaker has already made undoubtedly clear, this is undoubtedly true. Before I further establish this, I will first point out a few of the flaws in the opposition's argument. Now, the first speaker has stated that Mark Zuckerberg is not a viable example as he has stated that Facebook is a neutral platform used for communication among users. Now, there is much evidence against this. As the first speaker has already made clear, Mark Zuckerberg was involved in the, manip the political manipulation during the Brexit votes, which was a huge which was a huge violation against uh, democracy. To my first point, treating social media companies as publishers will draw clear rules in place of the blurred lines that currently dictate social media. Publishers have a clear set of laws that help regulate content released to the public. Social media, on the other hand, has a set of terms and conditions that are just not understandable. For example, Facebook's Statement of Rights declares that for content that is covered by intellectual property rights, you specifically give us a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use any content that you post. You get my point. Hidden amongst this confusing language was, and deceitful techniques, the company is basically saying that anything you post, it belongs to them. But this should break copyright laws, but due to the blurred rules, it slips through the cracks. This confusion about what is right and wrong is what allows these laws to be broken without consequence. Social media allows for these legal exemptions to be exploited and places a barrier that prevents users from understanding its regulations. A very relevant example is the difference between harassment and freedom of speech. Social media gives the public a medium to express opinions freely. However, there are many times when, free, when this free speech has crossed over into harassment and no action has been taken because it was lost between social media's blurred terms. In the words of Justin Patchen, a director at the Cyberbullying Research Center, there's an ongoing discussion about free speech. Pe the perception is that people have the right to say anything they want, but now they're pushing boundaries and crossing the line without any accountability. Should social media companies be treated as publishers under the law, these blurred boundaries would be replaced with solid rules that would prevent this exploitation and inaccountability that is so evident today. This leads me to my second point. Social media companies must be held accountable for their content. Now, social media encompasses a range of ways for people to connect, but it is increasingly being used to facilitate unacceptable behavior, especially in terms of defamation and hate speech. Social media platforms have time and time again withdrawn from taking action against certain extreme posts. This lack of regulation means that these hateful messages and incitements to violence are not only distributed, but amplified. YouTube is one example of how prominent hate speech is on social media. In 2019, the Anti-Defamation League released a report 
that found at least 29 YouTube channels that support anti-Semitic and white supremacist content. YouTube has also not taken any action against channels belonging to leading broadcasters of hate, including the infamous white supremacist Richard Spencer. In these circumstances, YouTube stated that they wouldn't interfere because it didn't violate the company's guidelines and to refuse to take accountability. This is simply outrageous and should not be allowed as the abuse of others, whether it's verbally or physically, or through discrimination or defamation, is, is strictly against the law. However, instead of preventing such occurrences, YouTube simply states it doesn't violate our guidelines and dismisses the matter entirely. Action must be taken against this exploit. With 2.3 billion people on Facebook alone, you may be wondering how social media companies are supposed to regulate everything that happens there. But the answer is actually quite simple. Instead of having incredible amounts of manpower, resources, and time dedicated to creating algorithms to find your political vulnerabilities, com companies such as Facebook, under our model, will be required to detect trends relating to verbal abuse and respond immediately to reported cases, thus preventing damage caused through content moderation softwares which are able to effortlessly filter through site content. It is obvious that social media companies do not currently have strict rules, have a strict set of rules, but with the legal requirements of being a publisher, there is not just a moral incentive anymore, because evidently that isn't working, but also a legal requirement to stop the spread of hate speech. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is apparent that the current way we legally deal with social media is completely inept, from confusing users, escaping liability, and providing opportunities for hate speech to become mainstream, the best, most effective, and simplest solution is that the law treats social media companies as publishers. Thank you. Individuals will not be solely liable for their own posts on social media. 
Instead, the legal responsibility will be put on the social media companies themselves. According to the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, a research center at Harvard University, a publisher can be held liable for anything that appears within their pages. This means that if the social media companies were treated as publishers, any individual who posts material, regardless of whether it is legal or not, would not be solely accountable for their actions. Instead, the social media companies would, although not having contributed to the content in any way, would be held responsible and have to face the legal repercussions of their users' actions. This was shown in a recent court case where Google was sued by a Melbourne lawyer, George Defteros, for defamation because an article detailing his previously overturned legal charges continued to appear atop search results. Defteros claimed that Google was the publisher of these results and thus should be blamed for their current appearance on search results. However, like many social media companies, Google was not the author of these articles, nor were they the ones to defame Defteros. Google was merely the platform that was used to convey the information. So how is it fair that Google should face the consequences of their users' actions? If social media companies were to be treated as publishers, events like this will become commonplace, meaning many social media users with nefarious purposes will not be, have any consequences. This leads me to my second point, which is that if social media companies were to be treated as publishers and were therefore liable for their users' actions, there would be a certain rise in the amount of inappropriate, illegal, or plagiarized content on social media platforms, as users would not be reprimanded for their actions. According to the Home Affairs Select Committee, there is a great deal of evidence that platforms such as Facebook are being used to sp spread hate, abuse, and extremism which is shown through the 865 million deleted Facebook posts containing undesirable content. If people were no longer subject to the consequences of their posts, this number would be seen to rise exponentially. This, this would lead to an increase in the required moderation by social media companies in order to limit this content. To realistically do this, according to an MIT technology review, Facebook would need to employ 15,000 more human moderators in order to regulate the 350 million photos that are uploaded to Facebook every single day, containing hate speech, murders, suicides, and other graphic content. According to the BBC, this degrading content has already led to depression, addictions, or other mental health-related issues in over 11,250 current Facebook moderators. With the need to increase the number of moderators, should the law treat Facebook as a publisher, the number of people who will experience these negative mental health issues will rise exponentially. Are we really willing to put tens of thousands of people through this horrific experience to, change, to cause so many unnecessary mental health issues to change a single law? No, no we shouldn't because this is fundamentally wrong. Thus, the law should not treat social media companies as publishers to ensure users continue to hold responsibility for their own actions. My final point is that social media companies would also remove pur purposely remove large amounts of law-abiding content due to the risk involved in being legally liable for all their users' act posts. An example of this includes the introduction of Germany's Network Enforcement Act, which according to The Guardian states that social media firms must remove hate speech within 24 hours of being notified or face fines of up to 44 million pounds. According to the Washington Post, this law has led to many genuine expressions of opinion being deleted due to companies being more conservative than the law dictates necessary to manage their own risk and avoid legal liability. But how can we let private companies decide how the basic rights to freedom of speech and opinion ought to be interpreted when they are clearly misguided by their own self-interest? Whereas if social media companies were not considered publishers, they would not face the risk of being held accountable for their users' posts on their platform, and thus they would not need to delete these clearly legal posts that share genuine concerns. To summarise, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, if the law treated social media companies as publishers, people would not be longer liable for their posts on social media, leading to an increase in the number of inappropriate posts. So ladies and gentlemen, do not shoot the messenger. Thank you.
nominative case, I call upon Isa. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's debate is that the law should treat social media companies as publishers. By the end of my speech, I will leave you in no doubt that this statement is true. But before I summarise our case, I will rebut the opposing. The second negative speaker has said, the company cannot edit or delete posts, so why should they be held responsible? However, we have already provided many, many examples of them clearly moderating deeming this invalid. Our opponents have also stated that social media should not be responsible for the content on their sites. I have to point out that before the 2000s, the whole concept of misinformation was seen as futile, but due to the dawn of social media, misinformation became wildfire. PhD researcher at MIT, Shrus Vashushi, has conducted a study on misinformation and found that it can that it can spread six times faster on social media than accurate news does. So, even if we are to assume that what the opposition is saying is true, we are still faced with the problems of hate speech and misinformation and the most effective, the most simplistic and the easiest way to combat this problem is by treating social media companies as publishers. The opposition has also tried to argue that we should not adopt our model because it will be too hard to enact. How ridiculous. There are two reasons why this is absurd. Firstly, just because something may be hard, just because something may be difficult and may not have the perfect result, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. To take the opposition's logic, it would be like saying, we should not make people wear seatbelts because it is too hard to make sure that everyone is doing the right thing. And yes, it may not be possible to get 100% of the industry to follow the rules, but for the other 99%, the benefits are well worth. Secondly, social media companies already have the resources available to enact the model. What I mean is, Facebook spends millions of dollars each year on developing software that can detect your political vulnerabilities. If this time and effort was applied to stopping misinformation and hate speech, the model could easily be enacted. Furthermore, software, which is currently very complex and is used to make you addicted to Facebook, can easily fulfill the role of human moderators, disregarding their whole argument about talking, saying about the mental health impacts and impracticality of using human moderators. Furthermore, they also haven't provided any alternative to the model. So if we weren't to do this, what were we to do? It, as Teddy Roosevelt said, former president of the US, complaining without providing solutions is merely whinging. The opposition has also said that by social media platforms becoming publishers, the purpose of social media is lost. As we have shown, the current way in which social media operates is extremely immoral and causes far-reaching impacts on our society and the integrity of our democracy. So, I ask the opposition, are they saying that the purpose of social media is to manipulate the public? Is the purpose to allow hate speech and abusive behaviour? Is the purpose to discriminate against people because of their political standing? I would like to think it isn't. And frankly, if that is the purpose, then there is no, absolutely no reason to change. I hope that what the opposition is trying to say is that the purpose of social media is to freely communicate with others. In which case, it isn't that the current system is perfect and that being treated like a publisher will corrupt this. It is the complete opposite. As you have heard from all of our speakers, hate speech and misinformation are too common on social media and the best way to stop it is by treating social media companies as publishers. They have also mentioned an example, Cambridge Analytica, as a breach of privacy. Their reasoning was that the platform controls what is distributed. But how is this related to Cambridge Analytica? They've used a slippery slope logical fallacy to connect a lot of unrelated dots to draw some futile conclusion. Because publishers are held accountable for everything they post or publish, if social media companies distribute private information that isn't considered whistleblowing, then they can be sued, meaning that any argument the opposition make about this is deemed invalid. Before I conclude, 
I would also like to point out that the opposition has not challenged the following arguments, and therefore they must stand as true. They have not addressed the fact that there are many blurred lines in the legalities of treating social media platforms. They also haven't mentioned the incredible issue of political manipulation, which will be stopped if social media companies are treated as publishers. In conclusion, the law must treat social media companies as publishers. The current laws placed on social media are so blurry, if not non-existent, that social media companies can exploit it to give themselves a massively unfair advantage in comparison to righteous publishers. Publishers follow the laws currently in place that stop the spread of hate speech and violent content, whereas social media gets away with this. And not only is this unfair, it simply means there are more, more people in greater society exposed to racist, homophobic, misogynistic and frankly despicable behaviour. This will be stopped when social media companies are treated like publishers because the platforms will be legally required to be much, much more careful and as we have said, it can be achieved. But it is not as though the effect of being a publisher will be purely to stop poor behaviour by users. The effect also stops social media companies from allowing, and in some cases endorsing, illegal misinforma misinformation. Ultimately, by the law treating social media companies as publishers, we can expect to see some very positive changes in both the form of stopping bad use behaviour, but also by stopping deceitful company practices. I trust in full confidence that you realise that the law... However, as we have stated before, 
This is simply too much content for social media platforms to handle and to effectively moderate, with us significantly disrupting the experience of the user. The platform should not be blamed for hosting horrific content, just as, just as it should not be praised for hosting endearing content. A social media platform, by its name, is a platform to allow users to express its thoughts, ideas, and opinion. And as the same goes, we should not shoot the messenger. The second speaker on the affirmative team has also stated that there are blurred rules for users on social media. This is clearly incorrect, since when you set up an account, before your account registration is accepted, you must accept the terms and conditions. No one is forcing you to accept them. They are laid out there in black and white for you to click, I agree. In Facebook's case, this means no nudity, no hate speech, and no excessive violence. And therefore, if content is posted that goes directly against their terms and conditions, Facebook has every right to take it down. Our first speaker has addressed the fact that social media companies and publishers are distinctly different, and that if the law treats social media companies as publishers, it will be changing the fundamental purpose of social media. She has also talked about how privacy breaches, such as the Cambridge Analytica scandal, would have become more apparent if social media, publish, social media companies were treated as publishers. Our second speaker has explained to you that if the law treats social media companies as publishers, the liability of content would shift from the users who actually posted it to the social media platform who is merely the point of communication meaning that these platforms would have to face the consequences of their users' poor online behaviour. In addition, there'd be an extreme rise in inappropriate and illegal content that is uploaded to social media platforms, which would make many more human moderators necessary, exposing even more people to potentially violent and graphic content. Furthermore, if companies are liable for their actions, they will also delete many legal posts in order to avoid legal liability. So, in conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the law should not treat social media companies as publishers. Remember, social media companies simply provide the platform only and should not be liable in the same way a traditional publisher is. Do not shoot the messenger. Thank you.
afternoon, everyone. My name is Mr Baker, um, and I'm representative from the Education Panel today. Congratulations on both teams today for making uh, this grand final. A uh, very high quality debate, we both agree, and a special achievement, I, I imagine, for, for having two teams from the same school. Uh, it was a f fantastic debate, and I, I wonder, we even, we even had a representative from uh, from Twitter, I don't know whether you noticed that the pigeon that came up was making several tweets. Uh, very interested in the, in the outcome of, of this debate particularly. Um, as each of the five adjudicators today have arrived at their decision independently, we won't give feedback, uh, unlike a normal round debate. Uh, but today's decision, I can announce, was a split decision. Uh, it was a 4-1 decision in favour of the affirmative team. Congratulations. <laughs> ceremony will now award the trophy uh, to the affirmative team. Thank you very much. Now, as you know, there will be a formal presentation by the Governor at uh, Sacred Heart next month. So, but, you know, it's nice to sort of touch the winning trophy, even just for a short time. So, uh, we, we have to take it back and have it in bed ready for our uh, 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 big presentation. So what we might do, and this is a good opportunity to take some photos too. Much harder to take photos um, at the, um, the, you know, the big presentation. So what we might do then is, if the winning team stands in front of the sign there, and our chairman will present you with the trophy. Sorry, yeah. Did you? James called us up, but I did notice that the chairman didn't get an opportunity to, to uh, ask the teams to do their vote of thanks, which we might just do now um, before uh, we do all this breaking up. The Forget what you've just heard. <laughs> 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 awesome. <laughs> and, uh, I call upon a member of the runner-up team from Glenonga Red to give a vote of thanks. Team Glenonga International High School Red, I'd like to thank the Chairman, Timekeeper, Panel of Adjudicators and Glenonga International Blue for a very entertaining debate. We'd like to warmly thank our friends and family and coaches Saskia and Jaidi for their appreciative support throughout the competition. We'd also like to thank Nazareth Catholic College for hosting the 2020 Year 10 Grand Finals and finally to Debating SA and the volunteers for helping raise a younger generation of debaters. for providing us with the ability to participate in these debates, the audience for coming along and to give us support, Nazareth for providing us with a venue, and to the chairman and timekeeper. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I now declare this debate closed.